Hi everyone, my name is Meenu, and I lead the machine learning infrastructure team here at Google. Today, I'm delighted to be here and to talk to you about a paradigm shift that we are seeing in machine learning development, something we refer to as data-centric AI. We use sorting algorithms regularly, but when was the last time you had to create one? Decades ago, there was tons of research into sorting algorithms. General purpose sorting algorithms like quick sort or heap sort were discovered. And other algorithms like sorting networks were created for fixed size inputs. While research continues today, for most of the applications, this is a solved problem. Whatever your standard library provides is probably just fine for your purposes. In the last few years, we have seen a similar trend in machine learning. When you are building a machine learning model, there are a series of steps that you need to go through. Acquiring data to use to train your model, preparing those data to address quality considerations, extracting the critical features from those data, and then training a model, which includes finding the right model architecture. Finally, you will evaluate your model, identify the gaps, and repeat the process. It used to be the case that most of the time in machine learning model development went into the training step. Experimenting with the different model architectures, hyperparameter tuning, and so forth. Over the last few years, though, we have seen a few model architectures have become dominant. With that shift, the hands-on time required for model training has been reduced significantly for most applications. Instead, we are seeing most model development time go into the other pieces of this picture, iterating on data used to train and evaluate the model. And that's what we are talking about when we say data-centric AI focusing on the data required to produce and evaluate the model. To illustrate this shift, let's spend a few minutes together building a large language model. We'll aim to produce something that's foundational, the basis of answering a wide range of questions, including interpreting a video or producing an image and response. Sounds good? Great. To start with, we'll need a ton of data. For a good starting point, we might try crawling the web. There is a ton of data, and it's relatively accessible. Having said that, with the increasing prevalence of machine learning applications and generative AI, website owners are starting to think about whether they want to make their data available for model training purposes. Let's say we crawl the data. Next, we need to prepare the data. For example, Associated Press distributed new, distributes news articles to all its members and will end up with the same article posted many times across the internet. We do not want to over-represent the data, so as to speak. But there are more subtle changes that we need to make in our data to meet our application goals. For example, in many languages, nouns are gendered, and historical biases may be visible as a result. An example you may have heard of is when you translate doctor, you typically get a masculine noun while nurse is typically a feminine noun. We might need to find ways of addressing these biases when they're visible in our data. Diversity in data sets is also important. It makes machine learning models more accurate and fair. Another example, Google Photos automatically creates album with holiday labels, like Christmas. We learn how to do this using the data that was labeled with holidays. Recently, we were able to ho identify holiday celebrations that we had not before, like Karwa Chauth. It's a festival celebrated by over a billion people in India. We were able to do this by hiring humans to help classify training data so that we could learn what these holidays look like. It's not enough to look at the photos of the most popular holiday, let's say in the United States. Rather, we have to actively acquire in order to provide full representation. Then after, we train our model, we'll need to figure out how successful we have been. To evaluate, we'll send a series of inputs, prompts, and look at the output of our model produces. Unfortunately, this isn't as simple as evaluating a sorting algorithm, where I can write unit test and see if it is correct or not. There is no right answer. Instead, there is a wealth of possible responses and shades of gray in response quality. Most often, we'll need to ask humans to look at the results, which is expensive, of course. Maybe worse, though, is that two reasonable humans might disagree about how good a particular output is. Frequently, we'll need to ask multiple humans to evaluate, 
making it even more expensive. But once we have paid all these costs, crawl the web, massage the data, remove biases, and make sure our data set was complete and representative, we have evaluated the results, we have iterated to address the shortcomings, we have done it. We have built a large language model. Great, let's start showing it to our users. We probably want to start off slowly and show our model to a relatively small set of trusted testers. Pretty quickly, one of them takes a picture of a freckle on their arm and wonders what it is. Our training set did not have enough data about skin conditions to be able to answer this question correctly. It used to be that machine learning developers would build a model specific to each vertical. One for skin conditions, another one for financial analysis, and maybe third one for movie recommendations. Today, with foundational models, you can start with the model we just built. It already knows how to understand language or interpret an image. In this case, the missing piece is information about what a skin condition looks like. To address this, we'll fine tune our foundational model with a good data set about skin conditions but we do need to find a good fine-tuning data set for this domain. Fortunately, there are lots of options for us to get better data, like paying the data providers to license their data. However, that brings up an interesting question. How much is the data set worth? This probably depends on many things, but one of them is how the data affects the model quality. Two independent data sets might substantially result in the same impact on the output of the model, so either one of them is probably sufficient, but both are not required. It's not just about the cost of acquiring data though. We might be able to fetch public data at low cost, but keeping that data as part of a model development is actually expensive. Machine learning users use tons of compute resources, and there's a direct correspondence between data size and model size. The more data we use to feed into our model, the more expensive our training and serving costs will be. If we can find that some of that data is not important, it could be very valuable. It will save us time and money. The, common, the most common way to find if a data set is useful or not is by running ablation studies. We would train a model with and without some data set to see how much the quality suffered. While this gives us a great way to interpret the results, it is also incredibly expensive. We can't run two to the power n studies. Understanding the value of data and creating a direct correlation between data and model is an important research problem. Well, we might decide that, you know, it's just easier not to answer these questions at all. The cost like data acquisition, risk of reputational damage, or model size of attempting to answer medical question just might be too high. Instead, we could say, sorry, please check with your doctor. But there are worse cases too. We might not want to help answer any question that might cause harm to someone. But how do you identify these questions? This is another area of research right now. Simply identifying the words that might be harmful won't be sufficient, as we'll reject valid requests and accept ones that we do not want to serve. There are websites that exist collecting inputs that can be used to jailbreak a model out of the guardrails that the developers intended. There is a continuing arms race between model developers and users, trying to ensure that our products only get used in the ways that we want to participate. One of the critical pieces here is creating data sets of problematic examples so that we can learn how to generalize these harmful inputs. These adversarial data sets are designed to expose problematic outputs exploring different safety dimensions. Once again, we see that data we use is critical in constructing a safe model. Over and over again, we have seen that data has become the most important component of machine learning development. Whether it is acquiring the right training data, or finding ways to combat biases, or counteracting adversaries, the data that we use in AI development, evaluation, and productionization is critical. Data is the focus of AI development today. With the shift to generative AI, we are spending even more time than before on data that we use in model development. This is still a new field, and so active research is happening as we speak. We still don't know how valuable the data is. 
we still don't know how it impacts our model performance. Or how do we ensure that this disruptive technology is not going to get abused? We have so much work to do, and the onus is on all of us to design and build products that leverage the power of AI responsibly. Thank you.